The 360 on Energy and Carbon, hosted by 360 Energy. 360 Energy is a North American leader in energy and carbon reduction. Recently, we have launched the 360 Carbon Excellence Program, designed to make corporate climate change actions more effective and successful. For more information, check the link in our podcast description. Welcome back, Dave and John. Welcome back. Yes, it's good to be here, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it is. And this, John, this is the second time we didn't over speak to each other. So we're like, we're doing well now on the Central. We're on a roll. <laughs> Very much so. So, so one of Dave's favorite things to bring up on this podcast is markets. So today we are talking about regulated versus deregulated markets. Dave, I'm sure you're really excited about this one. I am I am really excited about this, Lysandra, because uh, I think it's something that most people don't properly understand or what's involved in this. So hopefully we can shed a little more light to, in this topic going forward. For sure. So to kick off this episode, when we refer to regulated and deregulated markets, what markets are we talking about? Are we talking electricity, fossil fuels? Is it both? Okay, so let's get at that. So regulated versus deregulated. So the markets that are in that, so oil and natural gas can be regulated and deregulated, but mostly oil deregulated. Gas can be deregulated or depending on different jurisdictions or countries, it could be regulated. Electricity, same thing. So in Canada, we have two jurisdictions, Ontario and Alberta, that are deemed as deregulated electricity markets. And I'll, I'll certainly share more light on that. And then water, and this is going to be a quite inch. I want John to weigh in this. Like most people in North America would deem water as regulated markets, but John's going to give you a little heads up of in the UK about water, about the status of, of the, those markets. Yeah, we used to have a totally, well, and we've got to be careful with language crossing the water about water, but we used to have nationalised water supply. We now have a number of independent companies. And this is where the language gets confusing because in the UK, we have a free market on water. A little bit difficult to understand how that actually works. And I'm not really sure how it works, but one of the things we have when we've gone this way with the market, we allow the marketplace to become fully commercial, but then we impose a regulator on that market. So we have a, a body called Ofwat, which is the Office of Water Regulation. And that sort of acts as a, I, I don't know, a, a break on the commercial companies. It says to them that they can only get, you know, it controls their investment programs and everything else. So they're deregulated in your sense, but they have a regulator standing over them. Wait, right. So John, you're able to choose a water supplier then? That would have not understand. domestically, no. Okay. Uh, it's early days on it because what, what would happen, like a, a, a deregulated electricity market, you still have to have the same cables connecting to your house. It becomes a notional transaction as to who you're buying your water or your electricity from. Somebody once described markets like that as think as a swimming pool and it's full of water somebody at one end puts a bucket of water in and then somebody at the other end takes a bucket of water out and they have a commercial arrangement to do that but it all gets lost you know it may not be the exact bucket of water that was put in at one end versus what comes out the other so if we haven't confused our listeners already the point is well, that, that would have <laughs> verbiage and how it is deemed as regulated and deregulated may be seen and understood differently in Canada, United States, and the UK. So yes. the, the terms have to be properly in context to the jurisdiction that you're in. Well, following up to that question, I'm hoping we can point out some major differences, but what is the difference between a regulated and deregulated market? Yes, I, I like to talk about deregulated marketplaces first. And what does that mean? That typically means the consumer, the client, the business, has options of buying a commodity from suppliers that are in the marketplace that can provide that, whether it's natural gas, electricity, oil, or whatever that might be. So there's a choice. Like the key thing, there's a choice. You're not required to use specifically one party. And so 
What does that mean? It, it embeds competition. You have choices. Typically, when you have choices, that means customers are given options that maybe they're not normally given. If they only have one supplier, they can choose suppliers that have not only these options of what they can do, when they can do it, at what price point. So it drives the customer to pick what they want versus being told what they need. And that's, if, if our listeners hear anything, that's what I love about choice. I like that type of thing. Regulated. Regulated is, and I'll put this with John, you may modify based on the UK experience, but it, it's it's typically one choice that you have. It's a regulated where an over like a Ontario Energy Board would deem that here's the pricing that the utility can charge. It's been approved. It's been confirmed. There's different rate classes, but maybe just this would be a good time to explain to our listeners. When you look at a, your energy bill, whether it's natural gas, electricity, and water, they tend to be, and you may not see this or understand this, but they tend to be in buckets. Like there's, there's a commodity piece. So let's deal with a commodity like electricity. It's generation of electricity that's being produced from a generator. Then there's the transmission. So those are the long, like the wires for electricity, the, the high voltage wires. For natural gas, that would be a pipeline across Canada. And then the third piece is what we call distribution. And that's the same for electricity or natural gas. It would be your localized distribution company that would be bringing the gas or electricity to your location. And typically the transmission, and I'm saying specifically, and distribution for electricity are regulated. In natural gas, in the Canadian market, the pipeline, the transportation from the West to is deregulated, meaning you can find other suppliers to actually arrange gas, or you can go with the regulated, so you have choices. So the summary is, it's all about choices and what you have available, and so regulated, not so much, and it's defined. There are options, but limited, just to be clear, but there is options, I wanna stress it. Deregulated, a lot more options, you can pick what you want that's most suited to you. It's interesting you say that about choices because language apart, before we had a free market in energy, you, you're absolutely right. There would be a geographical jurisdiction like where I am. It's in the mid Midlands of the UK. So it was the Midlands Electricity Board. They had boards, so MEB, and they had a set of published tariffs and you chose from that. That's all you could do. You couldn't choose supplier or anything. Where we are now is you can choose in the UK domestically or commercially, industrially. You can choose from a whole range of licensed suppliers because you have to have a license to supply. And then you can end up thinking that's brilliant and being like some of our um, hospitals who are currently buying their uh, gas from a company called Gazprom which is actually a Russian gas company. And they never thought that that would happen. That's one of the things, you know, the choices that you get, you have to be skilled at making decisions because it's not just about price. There's a whole range of things there. Yeah, John, you said two words, two things that I think should be stressed. The In the deregulated marketplaces, most, if not all, the suppliers that are available tend to have a license associated with that. Now, you know, if you think about the oil industry, we all have choices in Canada. There's multiple gas stations we could go to and there's a branding associated with that. In the electrical industry or the natural gas industry, there are a variety of suppliers. And, and I wanna stress, not all suppliers are the same. Like some have limited options, some pricing is higher. They're not all the same. You need to really vet and understand who they are, what they make available. And actually even suppliers credit is really important for clients to understand because if you arrange a, a supply deal for natural gas electricity, and then also, which might be a very good deal for you. And, and, and that organization that goes bankrupt because they have poor credit. You really have to be mindful of that. Yeah, I think what you're covering there, and we've seen it here, we've seen a number of lower tier electricity suppliers have, have gone bust. Free market gives you choices, but if you were in a regulated market, you wouldn't be worrying about the, should we say, the stability of your supplier. But when you go to deregulated, 
you're absolutely right. You've got to view it like you were buying anything else. Is that somebody that you want as a supplier? As you said, they've got the credit rating. Are they going to be in business? You know, it becomes a full procurement decision rather than in the regulated market. It's well, which band of tariff do I think I can negotiate? I, I can say that we're on job done. And you know what? I've come across some people who liked that approach because it removed a whole lump of work that they would have to do, decisions they had to make. They found it easier under a, a regulated market because it took a, an element of the decision making out of their hands. And it's the same here, John. There, there's a number of customers um, that stay in the regulated market where they buy the commodity from the utility, uh, the you know the transportation, I'm talking about natural gas and distribution. But for most of our listeners, uh, that might look easier, and it is, but you tend to pay more money. Yes. Uh, because most people don't realize this. The regulated, the utilities, they don't make their money by selling commodity. They make their money pu by putting electrons or natural gas through their their transmission or their distribution lines. So they, but you'll want to know, you know, they don't have to be good at procuring natural gas or electricity. Plus they're trying to appease everyone from large clients to residential clients. So, so the unique and uh, thing of a uh, deregulated marketplace is that for a client ABC, they might have a risk management tolerance of doing this and they'll buy this way because it makes sense for them. And the customer down the road, XYZ, has a completely different risk management tolerance and they can buy it differently. And so that's unique uh, to them and it suits their business model because they understand their cost structures and things associated with that. I do want to make a parallel to kind of like something that our listeners may be more familiar with, but thinking of the manufacturing industry, let's say, let's say the automotive industry, you're an original manufacturer and you have your suppliers underneath you. And when you choose your suppliers, you're looking at quite a few different things. You're looking at pricing, you're looking at time frame, you're looking at if they're able to supply you with the amount of the component that you need. Uh, you're also looking for, you know, disruption. In this case with energy, these companies cannot afford disruption. They do not have time to think of energy as being something that might be a blackout period. If you tell an automotive company, okay, you could sign with, you know, this electricity company, it's cheaper, but you could experience more blackouts. That is not an option. They have timelines, they have deadlines. Things like variability are, are, not as an, are not an option for a company like that. However, for other companies, maybe something like, you know, timeframes and things like that might not be as important. So I think it is very similar to the manufacturing industry in the sense that you can pick and choose what are your top priorities. And based on that, you can make different decisions in a deregulated market. It's a great analogy. And Lysandra, as our listeners will know, most manufacturers do not rely on one supplier. They have a number of them to hedge their position. So it's the same thing that they would do on the energy supply. I do want to mention, because we've really focused on deregulated marketplaces because it gives choices, but I want to let our listeners know that actually, if you're in a regulated marketplace with knowledge base, you can still look at optimizing your costs. You're probably not made aware of that. You probably don't know those options. But literally what happens is, again, we mentioned this last podcast, understand how you use energy impacts what rate and what rate options that are made or could be made available to you. And so I think a lot of our listeners uh, that I, we experience, they, they think, well, at the regulated market, there's, there's nothing they can do. They just have to be price takers. Not so much, there is things you can do. There are rate options. So again, based on your usage pattern and your, what we call peak demand or contract demand, those have huge influences. And then there are programs that regulated markets have. They have demand response, they have for electricity, they have capacity markets for electricity, for natural gas, they have interruptible versus non-interruptible firm. So there are options. You'll want to understand how to take advantage of that. So I do want to make sure, because there'll be listeners that are in regulated markets, they go, oh, I, I, got, I don't have the options. You do, you just need to understand how to work in those mark in those regulated areas as well. 
So we mentioned regulated, we've mentioned deregulated. I can think of a lot of people in industry maybe listening right now that don't directly deal with their energy bills. Maybe purchasing handles it. So how would these organizations tell what market they're operating in if let's say they don't directly deal with the energy bill? Great question. And most don't. Actually, even customers that were in Canada, they there's some that don't even know in Ontario or Alberta that they're in deregulated marketplaces, right? They don't. How would you know? Well, you would know in many ways, depending on the, if you're deregulated, there will be a number of phone calls of people trying to reach out to the organization explaining or talking to them about their options. There can be on your utility because again, most people aren't aware of this. The utility bill has, it has a wealth of information and it can convey in the utility bill, you know, options, choices. It might even, some people don't even know this, that they, they, they may have signed up with a supplier. Someone set that up and it will identify in certain customers who the supplier is in the utility bill. Now that's not for all customers, but sometimes it will identify that in that. And and then the other thing is you'll hear often, whether it's your localized regulated utility, they'll, they'll start talking about options that you could consider as well in the marketplace. So I, th I think there's a, a number of things that are, that occur, but can I tell you that I find most people, when they hear about energy, it's so confusing. They they try to turn the page or shut the door so they don't have to hear it because it's, it is sometimes terrifying or scary and they rather not deal with it. So that's from my experience. John, how about you? I, I think you, you've touched on thing there. We, we've always said that getting hold of your utility bill is, you know, one of the basic steps of energy carbon management, the whole thing. I think the other thing that becomes interesting is is the, the separation sometimes between energy user and procurement. And, you know, in our marketplace here, if you're of any size, you you will you will sign up for a supply contract. And often we've come across people who aren't aware that they they've signed up a contract because that's been done by the procurement side of the business and haven't seen what the terms and conditions of said contract are. And they could have a real impact in how you're managing your energy and what, what you're doing. I think it's, how can I put it? I think if anybody's gonna be responsible about managing energy and carbon, one of the things they must do is identify who their suppliers are. And as part of that, are they being supplied within a regulated or deregulated market? It's good good management. And John, really good point. Another best practice to do for clients is to meet with their supplier yes. once or twice a year to one, ask what's going on with that supplier, regulated or deregulated. But also you want to convey to that supplier what changes you have, because that can impact your contract as well. And as John indicated, most clients don't understand that it can have a positive or negative impact depending on the changes that are going on. Sandra, I wanted to come back because you asked what are other ways to find out? You actually can Google. That's what and, I was going to say. I was going to yeah. say, you guys are being really fancy. I would just yeah. be like, I live in Ontario. What is my market? Enter. Yeah, yeah. no, you, you can't. Yeah. Uh, so call yeah, me. You, you, you can't. But again, I'm not sure it provides a lot. It, it will say regulated, deregulated, but I don't know what, if it really tells you what that means and how to work in it. That's no, it. agreed. I think there's also options to outsource. Again, if we're, you know, if you're a manufacturing company and you're sourcing an electronic component from a supplier, well, you can also outsource your energy by hiring an energy consultant or talking to an energy manager. Oftentimes, even with an initial meeting, they can let you know what some options are for your company and you can decide to proceed from there. So especially for big organizations, there typically isn't someone who wants to undertake this. There might not be a role where this fits under. So things like a third party would come in to, to help out there. Can I add to what you're saying? Because it's a very good point. Larger organizations, they'll tend to do the procurement at corporate office. And so whether they're in Canada or United States, what happens is they're familiar with their localized area, but they may not be familiar with the jurisdiction, whether it's in Texas or Alabama or 
Nova Scotia. And, and because of that, I often say to you, most people think procurement is a transaction versus a management technique or process. So it, you need constant ongoing knowledge and understanding of the market. So you're right to have that. It, it's worthy of using a third party if you don't have that knowledge or understanding of that. I think that's a very good point for to mention as well. Again, mentioning the automotive industry, I am from Windsor, Ontario, so we are a big major automotive com company a city. So most of these companies, and I've worked at a few automotive companies, they actually have, you know, different countries where they have similar, you know, manufacturing processes. So for instance, there will be a company in Canada, a company in the US and a company in Mexico, and all three will have different electricity and energy markets. And I think it's important for companies like that to actually not keep it almost at the corporate level, because I think it's important to talk about, you know, within your own country, but also see what's happening in your, your sister company at a different country and how it works there. And I think that's where hiring a third party does become really important because they're able to do those comparisons for you, which is something you might not find internally. Uh, Sandra, I think you're dead right. This is a, kind of a best practice again. You know, you have the corporate people doing this, but we're, we're always engaging organizations at the site level to really understand how they're using energy, where they're using, why they're using energy, but to establish a, a future load forecast on an hourly basis, what they're going to use. Because ultimately, and this has been repeated a couple of times in the last couple of podcasts, that information drives your procurement strategy. Using historical information on how you use energy is not the best philosophy to come up with a procurement strategy on how to buy energy going forward. And so, uh, from my experience, most of the corporate folks uh, in the finance or procurement really don't have a good understanding of the usage pattern. And so we engage sites to make sure they make that information readily available to corporate to drive corporate to develop a procurement strategy suited to that plant because each plant is different. So you are dead on. Sites should be involved in that. Another thing I want to add, because we're talking about energy, we're also talking about carbon depending on the jurisdiction you're in and we'll just use electricity for example and and clients are now uh, looking to reduce their emissions they need to understand for example electricity how's uh, electricity being generated is it with uh, hydraulic is it nuclear is it coal they need to understand that piece because ultimately that would change the carbon planning or emission strategy suited to the corporation and that again i'm going to tell you from my experience and we work with some large companies most of these procurement people are are not really in tune and understand the different generation assets that are used in jurisdiction so again there's value for the sites to be involved last thing still relating to this and that was from our previous podcast if you're going to develop a renewable strategy, whether you're going to generate your own behind the fence or forage from others, you really need to understand that usage pattern. So I'm emphasizing what you're saying. This is not a one person or one department's job. The sites do need to be engaged in this process, which often does not happen because it's seen as a transaction versus a management technique. And Sandra. By the way, based on the, the questions you had about regulate and deregulate, I actually think what we'll do on our website is we'll put in, uh, we'll update our websites, so highlight what are regulated and deregulated marketplaces for electricity. We'll try to do it for gas, so that, that uh, we'll try to do that as well. So that will be helpful for people going forward. So they can check our website, the 360 Energy uh, website in the future, and we'll put that in place. I think that'll be helpful to everyone. Agreed. Now we mentioned different ways that you can control energy purchasing in both markets, but I do want to summarize it a bit before we conclude our episode for our listeners. So how can an organization control their energy purchasing in a regulated market? All right. So how you do that is understand, first of all, how you use energy every hour, every day, by season, 
and then use that and meet with your utility company <clears throat> and convey to them, here's our projected low profile that we're seeing for natural gas or electricity. Can you share with us, based on the changing rate structure environment that you're in, what options do we have that we could help reduce our current costs? That I can tell you is not done, it's rarely done by organizations because they don't know that's the case. The other point you still want to ask them is, is there any other programs, whether it's demand response, interruptible firm contracts that, that you could consider or should be considering to implement at your site as well? And there are a number of jurisdictions in regulated jurisdictions that are now making these programs available. And the reason why they're doing it is they're, they may be tight for generation capacity. So they're trying to, instead of building new generation, which can take time, they get the client involved to actually mitigate the tightness in the capacity. So that's why they're starting to offer these programs. I, I see this happening more and more because as we get into more electrification, moving to electrification from fossil-based fuels, I, I'm concerned that the marketplace, the, the regulated markets won't move quick enough. So they're going to have to figure out another way of mitigating these constraints. I do want to add to that. I think we haven't mentioned this, but another way you can control your energy purchasing is by generating that energy yourself. So in terms of electricity, there's options for you to install like cogen, there's options for solar, you can even some some companies have wind turbines, they have batteries, some people do charge their batteries when grid pricing is cheaper, if you have peak periods and things like that. So there are lots of options. And of, of course, in, the, in those sense, when you're generating your own energy, you do need to contact a third party to help you get that started. But it is an option for regulated markets. Yes, and you're absolutely right. But you want to make sure in the regulated marketplace that they'll allow you to do that or what costs you'll be in, you might have because you're doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's people that might put cogen in and there'll be standby charges if you're taking power off the grid. So don't assume just because you're going to put it in, it's a, you, you, you do still need to speak to that regulated supplier to make sure that can be done. Agreed. So in the same fashion, how can an organization control their energy purchasing in a deregulated market? Well, that's even more exciting. You do the same pattern where you actually develop your future load forecast hour by hour, whether it's electricity, or natural gas, you find out if you are in a deregulated marketplace, you find out the suppliers that are available in the marketplace, you want to make sure those suppliers, that they fit your risk management strategy, meaning they have options available to you. There's contractual arrangements that you're comfortable with and that you understand because they all have contractual requirements. So you have to do that due diligence. And then what you want to do is, is sort of get a sense of what options are made available by those suppliers. You, and I want to stress this, you should be picking options that suit what you need, not what suppliers want to sell you. And that, again, is something is a missing ingredient that most people think, I'll just take whatever they want. No, in this case, you should be driving the boat and deciding what you want based on your risk management and your load usage and things of that nature. So a little more work, to be fair, so that might scare people, but I would say to you, the, the savings, the risk management is significant. It's very favorable. And so most organizations understand that and have done that for years. Maybe new people may not have understood in this, in this field that that's possible, the value of it. All right. Well, great episode on regulated and deregulated markets. I wanted to start off with John to give us our biggest takeaway for our listeners this week. Okay. I'm going to speak some Latin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Caveat emptor. And I don't know if you've come across the, the phrase, but it's used in legal circles and it means buyer beware. And it suggests as the buyer, you have a duty to check things out. 
So I think that's important. And I just want to touch on something we haven't touched on. In this country and other jurisdictions, people sometimes use an intermediary in terms of energy procurement. And you want to understand exactly how they are making their money. Do they, do they make the money out of a flat fee? Are they adding a hidden charge? Whatever. And so again, the whole thing is be a knowledgeable buyer. Dave, what's your biggest takeaway for our listeners? The biggest takeaway for our listeners is that energy and energy costs are completely controllable if you put the right processes and procedures within your organization. Yep. I, I want to just add to that. I think whether you're in a regulated versus a deregulated market, beyond markets, just look at your organization, look at how you operate, and see if there's operational changes. I think in processes, we typically are able to make adjustments when it's more feasible. You know, maybe your midnight shift can run the heavier electrical load equipment when it's off peak hours and cheaper. Take a look internally and see how you can play around with break times maybe. Maybe break times are during the peak hours so none of your equipment will be running. I think there's a lot of changes that you can make regardless of markets, uh, but markets are there to help you. And I think there's other people that can help you navigate them as well. And saying what you said, Lysandra, you've spurred another thought, which I hope people would appreciate. This is not a one person or one department's job. That this, this is actually the interest and the involvement can be uh, spread around other people. You, you'd be amazed once people get a taste of this, how interesting they like it and how it helps benefit the work that they're doing, whether in their operations whether they're in engineering, whether in maintenance, uh, it's this knowledge base can be very powerful for them in their job as well. Agreed. Well, thank you so much for a great episode, Dave and John. Thanks, Lysandra. It's, John? it's been good fun. It's been good fun. Well, I, I wonder when we're going to get an episode where we run out of things to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> Never. All right. Talk to you next week. That's all for today's episode of the 360 on Energy and Carbon podcast. Thanks for listening. Make sure to check us out on our website at 360energy.net and follow us on LinkedIn at 360 Energy Inc. Tune in to our podcast on Apple Music, Spotify, Anchor, or other listening platforms by searching the 360 on Energy and Carbon. You can watch the video recording and subscribe on YouTube at 360 Energy Inc. Email us your feedback at podcast at 360energy.net or comment on our LinkedIn posts. See you next week.